Sure. Thank you so much, Laurie. My name is Samantha and thank you for having me today. And today we have two wonderful panelists with us. Uh, let's keep the ball rolling, shall we, by doing a self-brief introduction. Maybe, Christopher, you want to go first and then followed by Sumi. Sure, yeah. So, hey guys, uh, Chris here. So, uh, uh, my, my role here at, uh, at Insider is I currently head up the partner success team uh, across Singapore and Malaysia. So, a few different regions. So, ultimately, what, what we aim to do and, and what our, our core business is, is to improve and drive growth across e-commerce funnels, uh, across many different verticals and industries. Uh, by really kind of leveraging customer journeys and ensuring, you know, those, those personalized experiences are reaching people uh, as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible. Uh, I was here last year and, and I'm happy to be back. And uh, yeah, just a, a quick hello from me again. All right, let's move on with Sumit. Hey guys, uh, I'm Sumit Ramchandani. Um, I currently um, head up the media group for um, AirAsia. It's a, it's a very new group that we started about two years ago. Well, that being said, uh, just as an FII, uh, I'm also serving out my notice period, so um, I'll be I'll be taking up something new, you know, sometime soon. Yeah. But that being said, you know, my past experience has largely been around e-commerce personalization uh, on the client side, agency side, and um, I'm looking forward for the discussion today. All right, awesome. Okay, diving into our topic for today, which is personalized experience e-commerce. I'm always very curious and wonder if uh, both of you have any you know, interesting case study to share with us. But right before I let you attend to that question, let me also do a quick shout out to all our audience who is tuning in with us right now. Feel free to populate at the chat room and submit your question using the Q&A button right at the bottom. I will try to pick up a few interesting questions along the way in our 30 minutes session for today. All right. Back to our my question, my curiosity, which is the case study. Any of you would like to go first to share with us any interesting case study that you have encountered before? Sure. So I can uh, I can kick this one off. So sure. uh, I think one of the one of the interesting case studies that we've uh, done previously with uh, um, a couple of different airlines actually, and and, and also e commerce businesses is leveraging uh, user segments. So what we tend to do, and, and again, maybe I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I won't go into too much detail about this because I think we have a few questions later on in terms of you know, approaches and, and how we kind of tackle things. Uh, but we do a deep dive into the data uh, or user data that um, you know, users are browsing websites, they're looking at certain products, they're looking and engaging with the website in many different ways. And, and fundamentally what we do is we're able to predict and understand you know, what are the kind of products that this person is looking to purchase. With this kind of knowledge, what we then do is we would then personalize the website accordingly. So for example, um, one of the things we did with uh, Singapore Airlines, uh, a client of ours, was based on a user browsing certain destinations and, and they had a certain affinity for certain destinations. What we would do is actually change the, the entire kind of format of the website and tailor it towards those destinations. So for example, if I'm looking for flights back to London, uh, when I next come back to the Singapore Airlines website, London would be the first destination that I see on the website. We would see visuals, we'd see images, we'd see relevant offers, uh, and really kind of personalize that, that user experience ultimately to drive you know, conversion rates, um, but then also just make life a little bit easier for people. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's making your life a lot easier, quicker, faster to find it, find what they need and, and ultimately, you know, kind of drive the, the conversions that way. So that was a, a couple of or, or an interesting use case, which we've run in the past. That's, that's actually been very successful. And we do this for, for many different partners uh, across many different verticals, you know, including e-commerce as well. All right. Awesome. Let's move on to Samit. Yeah. I mean, frankly, if you ask us you know, being in an airline industry, uh, the last the last eighteen months or so has uh, has not been much about driving conversion, clearly. So uh, for us, you know, we uh, we actually adopted personalization primarily to uh, support and resolve our um, customer issues and drive relevancy. Eventually, that's the goal of personalization, right? Driving relevancy, whether it's on sales, whether it's on marketing, or if it's on customer support. So uh, for us, what we did was uh, we have, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but in our app, we have created this chat platform. And in that chat platform, there are various groups that are being created. We call those channels, you know, and those are segmented by destinations, you know, by traveler types, et cetera. 
So for us, the important learning was as the pandemic hit, uh, we actually wanted to still obviously continue to be relevant to our consumers, even though the travel had almost come to a standstill. So our, our tactic or the strategy that we adopted was almost become a publisher and drive in information, especially at that time when there was so much unclarity around travel related information you know, to all our consumers through these different chat groups. So as an example, if we have people, you know, who are members of our, you know, Bali chat group, and they get messages, you know, notifications, information that is related, you know, to what is, what is the travel look like? What is the travel procedure in these pandemic times in, in Indonesia? All right. uh, similarly, we took before Lankavi, that would be for Malaysia. So that's, that kind of drove relevancy and engagement. And that we also helped move some of our customer complaints that were out in the social media into our chat platform and resolved it through there. So that was kind of our internal, um, you know, approach to get our feet wet in personalization. But that being said, all over there are too many just excellent cases on personalization, which we'll get to later, but I didn't, I didn't want to hog the whole night life for now, yeah? Yeah, I'm just curious, uh, as you mentioned just now, Sumit, on the chat box, is it one of the way to, you know, to like curate the personalized experience, especially in e-commerce? I'll get back to Christopher after this. Yeah, for us, it is, right? Because I think it makes sense for us also because in a couple of different ways. One is, you know, as I spoke about, you know, if we are looking at personalization that is hitting three goals, you know, whether it's marketing, sales, or customer support. So on the marketing front, your objective is generally to drive customer engagement, right? And enrich the customer engagement. But when, when there are users on our chat platform, you know, and we're able to, we know a lot about those users, we are able to enrich the experience by feeding them the right content. You know, as even Chris mentioned that, you know, if, uh, if people are interested in a certain destination, you're going to show them the content that is related to that destination, whether it's on your website or your chat group, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that serves its purpose really well on the marketing. And the second one on the sales also, you know, as we have any promos coming up, as you may know that, you know, AirAsia is fairly big on promos. You know, uh, of course, we're going to spend on social media, but at the same time, you know, social media and Google can turn out to be pretty, pretty darn expensive. You know, and it, it does very little, you know, to to actually drive loyalty to your brand. You know? So what we instead do is that, you know, we, we, of course, balance it out, you know, by by running the promos and providing those notifications on our chat app as well. You know, so that kind of helps with, you know, our, um, our reducing the cost side or with paid media. And then finally, on the support side, I already spoke, you know, the, the things that we did. So yes, for us, you know, the chat is a kind of an important platform for personalization across all of the three goals that I mentioned. Okay, cool. Chris, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I think I think just uh, adding on on this point as well, like uh, maybe not not so much on on the personalization aspect, but uh, you know, having having that chat functionality, I guess, you know, it's it's creating that kind of one. The one connection which is super important for consumers nowadays you know especially being uh, a lot of offline businesses are, are no longer around you know there's no, no longer can we go into shops and have people kind of engage with us understand what it is that we want what it is that we're looking for and and then obviously you know recommend the the relevant products and and, and that sort of thing and i think you know having that kind of chat functionality really does allow that kind of personal connection uh, and as I mentioned, you know, across all the three different aspects, like it's important to have that kind of personal touch where you feel like you're not just dealing with uh, a, a brand, but you're, you're dealing with a human being at the end of the day, right, who's communicating to you. And, and that always creates a positive experience, especially during COVID times, uh, you know, actually speaking to people and engaging people on that one to one basis really does drive that kind of customer satisfaction for sure. So uh, it's definitely an important thing to, to bear in mind and, and an approach to take when engaging people especially nowadays during COVID. So uh, yeah, it makes, makes sense. Okay. Um, adding to that, right. Um, I'm just curious if uh, whether Sumit or Chris, you guys is actually doing any ads in Google or be Google ads or Facebook ads just to, you know, give that personal touch to the audience, like based on their browsing history, are you guys targeting them based on the browsing history or if you are using any other method to you know to cater this uh, personalized experience to them to your audience sure so i think uh, perhaps i can kick this one off so we we actually have we, we run a partnership with google uh, where we feed audience data directly into uh, google platforms uh, so essentially what we're doing is we're actually using uh, machine learning and and, and ai right. to understand uh, user preferences 
understand, you know, how likely is it that this person is going to be making a purchase within the next week or so. Uh, and then also having a look at what are their particular category interests, you know, what product lines are they interested in uh, and feeding this information directly into Google, allowing people to then select these users and, you know, tailor the content accordingly. Uh, as I'm sure everybody's uh, everybody's aware, whenever they open up, uh, you know, a uh, Google search or you know, you're blasted by ads left, right, and center. So you know, it needs to be relevant for people to actually engage with it, right? Like that's that's fundamentally the the, the most important thing. There's no point in showing me an advert for something that I've just made a purchase of, right? Like uh, I've just bought something. Absolutely. Here, like why, why am I why am I seeing that again? So you know, we 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 kind of leverage predictive technology to understand user interest. Uh, coupled with browsing behavior as well. So it's kind of a mixture of the two. Uh, and then feed this into Google where then our clients and, and our partners, essentially what they're able to do is leverage that to you know, display relevant content and engage that user, ultimately to drive the conversion as, as quickly as possible you know, in, in the e-commerce world. So uh, that's, that's how we tend to interact with, uh, with Google ads. And, and you know, a good, uh, there's a good couple of examples of, of us doing this before in, in the past as well. All right, so there is a sort of like API integration between the Google Ads, uh, the data from browsing history, mm -hmm. together with uh, what are you providing to your customers Correct. in order to drive, yeah. you know, your partners and client success. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so maybe we want to hear from you. Yeah, I mean, as Chris mentioned, you're you're absolutely right. There is uh, there's always that piping that is there between you know the Google Ads and your uh, first party data. Uh, the the one thing is that I mean retargeting is the most easiest case of personalization. Right? I mean that's that's you know it's a it's a no brainer. You know it kind of it delivers its ROI. You know it's uh, it does the conversion. So it does the job. But that's uh, that's kind of it's been done to death, right? So now for us, actually, if you uh, for us ads as a as a micro personalization tool for the brand that we are perhaps doesn't make sense. You know it might make sense for some other brands, but if you look at what we are about, you know, which is you know now everyone can fly. You know, it's really about driving that uh, that widespread awareness around what we have to offer. We do segment our users, and we segment our users a lot. You know, it's just that we can't go down to a segment of one because it really doesn't would, wouldn't make sense for you know our consumers. So in this case, I'm I'm being a bit of a I guess devil's advocate for personalization. That while it works well in most cases, there are brands and there are businesses you know where uh, in some areas and some channels you know personalization just may not make business sense so an example I see is the Air Asia I see area. I see okay so A Asia is actually uh, dividing all these uh, customer into segmentation and not just you know just deep dive into one specific category am I right yeah that's well not no, yeah we, are, we don't do micro personalization mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and okay kind of, wouldn't give us the, the yield and ROI that we needed. Okay, all right. Uh, Chris, do you have anything to add on that while we are waiting for the audience to, you know, to give us a Q question under the Q&A box right below? Yeah, so I think, I think it makes uh, makes perfect sense what Sumit said. I mean, ultimately, there's, there's that balance, right? Like, uh, for, for it to make sense, you need to be targeting a, a good amount of people to be able to see any form of ROI. At the end of the day, you know, you need to take that kind of data-driven approach and, and that kind of value mindset as well. Uh, you know, it, it makes sense for, for some people. And, and again, I guess it's it's more kind of vertical specific. Um, but, you know, when when people are sort of, you know, transforming into more of lifestyle brands and, and really kind of focusing on, on awareness and getting the name out there, I mean, awareness is about getting your 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 brand and, and your product offering in front of as many people as possible, right? And and as cheaply as possible. Like let's 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 be real. So you know, when it comes to personalization and, and awareness, you know, that's that's not the that's not the aim of personalization, right? So it makes makes perfect sense what Sumit is saying. Like you know, not wanting to 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 really go down to that segment of one because you know you're going to spend a lot of money to convert this one person but you know you're not, you're not generating widespread awareness and and uh, i think you know it, it ultimately makes sense um you know where, where personalization is only really relevant to certain brands and and, and again you know from uh, from a retargeting perspective but i think you know not not necessarily only uh, retargeting but also using this across other channels as well right i think one of the one of the very easy uh, or straightforward examples of personalization is, you know, in email marketing strategies, right, where people are, you know, communicating to people on a one to one basis, you know, in every email that I've signed up to, I'm always addressed, oh, hey, Chris, how's it going? Like, they know who I am. Uh, and, you know, they, they can actually, you know, personalize the content according to me. 
so some interesting things. I mean, one, one of the actual very interesting use cases that we've, we've run in the past is with a particular media group like Media Prima, uh, where we've, we've done some work with these guys on actually personalizing uh, the actual uh, content on their website. So that, you know, if I know, for example, if I go to uh, NST or, or something like this, and, and I'm somebody who's super into my sports, you know, maybe the first couple of articles that I see would be sports related, right? Uh, so I think, you know, it's, it's important to, to, to know that, you know, personalization is not just limited to ads, but it's also across all these different channels as well and all these different touch points, which is super important in the overall customer journey, right? Like fundamentally, you want the general customer experience to be consistent. Uh, you know, you want to be showing the same things across your different platforms, be it your mobile app, be it your website, be it your email marketing, be it your notifications, you know, be it SMS as an example. And, you know, we've got all these upcoming channels as well, right? Like WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger. These are these are now things that are starting to come to light that, that could really be taken advantage of uh, from a personalization standpoint. I guess the, the, the potential blocker moving forwards for personalization is, is you know, uh, privacy regulations and, and all these kind of things, right? And, and giving consent. And I guess that's a whole nother discussion, but uh, fundamentally, you know, it's, it's something that can be done across all these different channels to, to drive that kind of consistent experience, right? Yeah, Chris actually bring out a very good point because from my personal experience, I do get irritated when the same ads, you know, like keep bombing me from different different platform. My next question would be how both of you manage the balance point of it. Like, you know, just, just nice to remind customer or client about your brand awareness, but not to chase them away. Maybe Sumi, you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, Frank, what you mentioned, Samantha, is the, is the problem that all of us have experienced, yeah? Um, the, the thing is that a lot of these things happen is because uh, there, is, uh, there is not a clear sync across channels. So no marketers would want to drive their customers away, right? So it's not, it's not an intention of the marketer to bombard, you know, uh, consumers with ads uh, so much so that, you know, they, they turn the other way. That being said, these things do happen and they really happen because of, you know, the wall gardens that we have and, you know, where your frequency capping across different channels, you know, is hard to sort of sync up. Um, it works better in this case, you know, and even for privacy, as, uh, as Chris, Chris mentioned earlier, it works better for brands that have a sizable first party data. Mm. So, you know, companies like Lazada, like an AirAsia, like a Gojek, you know, then that have the massive scale and quality of first party data, you know, that's, it allows them to calibrate, you know, their, their database a lot better, especially with their, the campaigns that they're running for their existing customers, you know, to, not bombard them, you know, with ads across channels, you know, and those are the, those are the, you know, kind of companies that would now start to take a march on these other companies because, you know, they have the database, you know, they have the scale, they know how to not annoy the audience and deliver just that right level of, you know, awareness and um, messaging, you know, that is needed to drive conversion yes? and, and drive positive experience as well. So I do believe that, you know, the first party data is a very powerful tool to counter against, you know, the, the ad annoyance that we come across, you know, right, left and center. All right, Chris, you have anything to, you know, to share it? Uh, I mean, the, the only thing I would add to it is, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's unfortunately, it's, it's a trial and error uh, kind of situation as well, right? Where you don't really know until you've got some findings and you've got some data. I mean, obviously, people don't want to be bombarded. And we can have a rough idea in, on the top of our head in terms of, you know, uh, will this be effective? Will it drive away my, my audience, you know, on all these kind of aspects? We don't really fundamentally know until we've given it a try right and, and really kind of understand how our audiences uh, kind of behave so you know there's there's no set standard for anybody uh i think obviously there's best case practices but pretty much what what i'd recommend is you know just going out there trying a few different things you know again you can put frequency capping in place and you know all these different aspects so i think fundamentally you know just give it a shout give, give it a try sorry and and you know see see what the data says right like uh, i think one of the key things as well to to, to bear in mind is we can't you know, feel what is right. We need to see the numbers. We need to show uh, that this is a valid way of doing things, right? So it's always, always justify by testing, numbers. Right? Well. Yeah, correct. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now I. Yeah. Why these things also happen is because sometimes there's a difficulty in internal coordination because your social media team would be different sometimes from your search team, you know, which would yeah. be different, you know, from your from your branding team. You know? 
And sometimes when there's a corporate branding campaign running, and at the same time, you know, the social mm-hmm. media running or running a tactical business campaign, you know, and then there is the search ads running at the same time, then it kind of becomes, you know, the, the whole frequency capping, even if it is a tool that's available, it goes for a toss because there is no inter- internal sort of coordination on who's running what. You know? That's the other reason, you know, why, why the annoyances happen. Mm, okay, right. Okay. Now I am going to pick up some question from our audience. Um, Kate would like to ask both of you, about chat box, while they are automated and somewhat personalized, are they as effective? You know, the live chat function is there, but they are still not human per se. So maybe we go with Sumit first. Um, I mean, I don't think, frankly, chat is at a level yet where it can be fully automated, <laughs> and it's not. You know, it's so uh, it's it's very important to have you know um, a human in flesh, you know, supporting it. Um, yes, you're, you're able to gain efficiencies for standard queries. So the, the out of the box engines that are available on chat are smart enough that they can tap into your database and mm-hmm. understand what the consumer is saying and kind of connect the dots, you know, somewhat, you know, so to that extent, I would say that it does eliminate about 30, 40% of, you know, the, the needs currently at least. Uh, but that being said, you know, the, the nuances of actually answering some of the, the finer questions, you know, especially when there are when there are words that can be misconstrued in different ways, or rather can be construed in different ways. That's when you know you need you need someone that does the moderation and also you know response responding responding to the uh, to those questions in in flesh, as opposed to just relying on a bot. So frankly, our dependence on bot is at the moment is not not very high, uh, also because you know our chat platform all is relatively new. These things, you know, because they have machine learning built in, it takes a long time for uh, the machine to understand the pattern over time, you know, for it to be able to be, uh, to be able to resolve more and more queries on its own. So we do believe that over time, the indexing would happen more towards bot and less towards human. But that being said, it's never going to go away. At least that's, that's not how I see it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree actually with that. Like, uh, it's, it's, it's nowhere near to the point where we can just let it and forget it. Uh, I think it, it definitely needs that still, still that human element. And I think, you know, from personal experience of using live chat functionality and, and, um, you know, chat live chat on, on websites, you know, it, it really does help actually a lot, uh, especially on the more customer support, customer service, uh, aspect. Right. I think one of the things that, that I do myself to kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, in, engage our, our, our clients and, and customers on, on using chatbot functionality is that essentially, you know, I, 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 I kind of compare it to being in a restaurant, right, where you're sitting down, you have somebody here who's, who's, who's a waiter and, and they're, you know, coming to take your order, giving you recommendations, you know, asking, you know, that kind of personal touch. And I think even though, you know, the chatbot to some extent is automated, there will always be uh, somebody at the end of there. Uh, to kind of help guide and, and kind of give you that kind of personal aspect as well. So, I mean, I, I personally think they are uh, useful. And, and I mean, from what I see from a lot of sites, you know, they're, they're now implementing this as, as kind of standard practice, um, you know, and, and I think it's, as, as Sumit said, it's not fully automated. There are people on the end there just uh, engaging with those people at that kind of human level, if you like. Um, mm. So, yeah, I think it's it's something that I would say is, is, is effective and, and quite important in, you know, engaging and, and kind of building that kind of rapport with, with your customers. Yeah, all right. Um, there's another question from the audience. Uh, let me just uh, wrap up with attending to these two last questions. One of the audience asks, how do you measure KPI based on customer experience apart from rating, you know, like five star, four star, three star? I mean, for us, the, the big the holy grail of KPI is uh, is our uh, NPS. There is uh, which is a net promoter score. Um, it is it basically gives us you know both the quantitative as well as the qualitative insight of the customer experience. So by the way, any any measures that we collect online, I mean I think stars is also basically a quantitative measure, right? It can it can tell you the what it can tell you the what they're feeling, but it can never tell you why and how. So for that, you know, it is it is important to substitute with uh, time and again, you know, with uh, with surveys and focus groups, you know, that kind of gives you that insight. And Absolutely. So the, you know, the customer experience is is uh, is a fairly hairy beast, you know, to distill it down to a single metric, you know. But if there were to be one, I would say that net promoter score is sort of the you know kind of indicates that all right, if a consumer is willing to be your promoter and an advocate, 
then you've done your job and hence the experience is positive. Okay. Yeah, hundred hundred percent. Like uh, NPS is is the standard. Uh, I think this is this is what everybody's using. You know, different brands. And again, you know, I think it's it's important to uh, really kind of ask for this and drive for it. And as Sumit mentioned, you know, one of the things that brands also do is they'll ask for you know that rating of of one to ten or or, or whatnot. Um, but then they'll also ask the why and and how questions, right? Like you know what like what does it take for us to get to that 10? You know, what, what, what is that gap? And, and kind of helps you identify this. So, you know, I think NPS is fundamentally the, the North Star when it comes to a KPI. I mean, there are other things that you can look at, but, but like, to be quite honest, yeah, I mean, it's, it's mostly about the NPS part. I mean, one of the things you could probably start to look at is, you know, from time to purchase, are people spending a lot of time trying to navigate, find things? You can look at some softer metrics to understand, you know, what is general. Uh, customer experience but then also you have the reviews as well if if the review on products that you're selling you know uh, some of the reviews that i've seen on products that have been solved are all about the shipping experience right which is a little bit unfair on the product itself but you know this is this is something yes. that impacts overall perspective as well right so i think it's important to run uh mps as, as the north star metric but there are a few other things that you can look at yeah Mm-hmm. And the last question that we would like to address for today is, you know, besides like uh, while we are collecting data, besides like email marketing, is there anything else that we can do or the audience can do to improve or get started on personalized experience? Was it like, you know, personalized vouchers or things like that? Yeah, I think uh, I think starting off on on this one, like, uh, is there anything else to start and improve on the on the general kind of personalized experience marketing? And you mentioned email marketing as as one aspect. Uh, I think as as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you can do this across all channels, right? So email is is a single channel. It's also a channel that you know I think is is important and core to today's business, but will pro- probably you know start to phase out as other channels start to come into play, you know, later on down the line as well, right? Like. Uh, Things are things are evolving, so you know it's it's about keeping the experience consistent across you know you know your email marketing across you know if you're if you're running a .dot com, you know you can also run personalization on a .dot com as well. You know it's very very simple, very straightforward to start on this, uh, and kind of engage those users at that that personalized level. Um, so you know just just it could be simple things like saying oh hey Chris welcome back. You know that's that's an element of personalization right it's a nice personal touch but then how do you then build a build on this as well as, as as things move on and i think you know another great way to drive that personalized experience on on dot coms is through surveys as well right like not only nps surveys but just asking general questions from 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 your user group as well and, and doing this in in the right way because again you don't really want to scare these guys off yeah i see you smiling over there to me you have anything to add on that no, actually, uh, I, I don't have anything real to add. In fact, I was listening to Chris, and the reason I was smiling is because you know he was uh, he was saying exactly you know what was going on in my head. Uh, so that being said, I'm I'm fully in alignment with what he said. Okay, great. I think we have come to the end of our session today. Thank you so much to uh, both of us. Samantha, oh, just yep. to interject here, we have time to squeeze in one more question, and then we have okay. Like- one more question. Yeah, okay. let me look at the Q and A. Yeah. Okay, we have an audience who asks. What is the most successful campaign that you can share with us? I think we have covered in the early part, which we share about the case study, right? Let me move on to the other question. Okay, good morning, panelists. Would appreciate your thoughts. I am a seller on Shopee and Lazada. Utilize marketing tools provided by the platform. So from the marketing cost and ROI perspective, will advertising on Google Ads and Facebook Ads worth it for that's uh that's really a tough one to answer it's the, the one question i would ask you um, edgar is to first um, you know let's let's understand how do our consumers spend their time and where do they spend their time yes <laughs> if you really look at that yes you know the platforms provided by shopee and Lazada can all the marketing tools provided by them could be great for conversion but frankly they do that for all the other merchants as well and their campaigns are largely going to be focused around promotions. It is going to do very little to drive your brand awareness. And why awareness is important is because once you start building your brand awareness, then over time, you know, your need for promotions start to go down. You know, True, and- true. I agree with that. 
you're able to build loyalty and you're able to capitalize on margins, you know, and that's when um, especially Facebook, if not Google can help. Google will help with the intent driven search words. But then I think if the, with the kind of cost parameters that we've been seeing, it becomes really difficult for a small and medium businesses to compete with the big brands on, on Google key SEO search words. Yeah? So you're gonna have to go long tail on it and you know be a little bit gorilla like on Google. On Facebook, Facebook does offer a wider creative campus. You know, I mean, Google has the YouTube, which offers that as well. So what I would suggest is that, you know, to <clears throat> primarily drive broad awareness and brand loyalty as such, you know, to use uh, the creative aspects of what Google and Facebook have to offer and create campaigns specifically to on around those, those goals and marketing objectives. Yeah, I mean, nothing, nothing to add from my side. Uh, I think, yeah, I think uh, Summit Summit someday I'll pull up. Okay, um, Laurie, you want to take over? Thank you so much for, you know, all the audience that tuned in to our session today. Over to you, Laurie. Thank you so much, Samantha. And to you guys who are watching right now, let's give them a big round of virtual applause. This was a phenomenal uh, first panel discussion, you guys. You set the bar really high. And um, I just have to go ahead and thank you guys, you know, for showing us that even though we are in an uncertain time, that we still have to keep things up to standard. We have to stay up to speed on how we can continue to personalize experiences for our customers. So to you guys who are watching, I hope you've learned something. Let's say thanks. Uh, Samantha, I'll see you next week. A fantabulous job. And we also like to extend our thanks once again to Sumit and Chris. Thank you so much being a part of e-commerce fest 2021 i'll see you guys soon thank you all right bye guys thank you. see ya bye thank you you're welcome exabytes grow your business online